welcome to the session um, sponsored by the Austrian uh, Central Bank. I'm very happy uh, to host two uh, presenta uh, presenters today. Um, I'm the, last, uh, the third presenter, but I will present the second. Um, yeah, it's about um, uh, monetary policy and exchange rate markets. And uh, each presenter will cover uh, a detailed uh, topic in this broad topic. And exactly, we will start with Pavel. Uh, then uh, he will be discussed by Amina. Then we move over to my presentation. And I will. Uh, very much looking forward to the discussion by Paolo. And finally, Daniel will be uh, concluding the session with uh, session by uh, Will. So uh, thank you very much uh, again, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much. So, so the usual big thank you to the organizers, to you guys for coming over, and also to the Fiskaradische Nationalbank for uh, kindly hosting us and having it in this session. So, you know, kind of to jam back one, so let me get started. So, work, I should say, with Christopher Ursek and Jesper Linde, who are both my bosses at the fund. Martin Kolasko is a colleague at the fund, and Harun Muntas, who used to be a colleague at the Bank of England, and now at the Mary University of London. So, uh, since many of us are at the fund, the, the standard disclaimer applies. I'm going to jump right in, and in a way, you know, the previous discussion, he and its reason was sort of a very good introduction. So my motivating slide is going to have these two figures, right? Really, we've seen central bank balance sheet swell up as a share of GDP, and also the share of assets outstanding, and kind of the very big picture question that we will be asking in this paper is, you know, what happens when you run these assets down? So questions about the timing, you know, are still very, very much alive. You've heard them being referred in the discussion. Uh, Laurie was surprised that people think that this will come to a halt. And um, I guess more specifically, what we'll be interested in is, you know, what is going to be the domestic transmission of QT? In effect, we've never seen it happening. So that's where the mo a model is going to come in handy. And what are going to be the international spillovers? So these will be the two themes that we'll be looking at in our paper. So the, the paper really has three bits. So the first part is empirical. What we do is we kind of study the effects of large scale asset purchases empirically. And here I, I need to apologize to the discussion because I can't uh, So the empirics is something that we've been working on. We had the, the paper discussed a couple of times. So a lot of it is new and maybe different from what you see. I guess perhaps some of them in the discussion will, will make it clear why we kind of kept on working on it and because we think the new results are nicer. So I decided to put it in, but that's sort of the only part that, that she hasn't really seen. I think the results kind of uh, appeared yesterday uh, late. So that, that was the last thing that included. Okay, so we will focus on, yeah, as, as I said, on the domestic transmission and spillovers. Then what we're going to do is we'll motivated by these empirical results, we'll build and parameterize a DSD model to try and uh, study the role, which will have a role for a QEM QT. We're going to have a few twists relative to, to extant papers, behavioral discounting and convexity in price setting. And what we're going to do is they will imply, first of all, that QE works. So it's kind of interesting to analyze it in it. But we don't have, we're not going to have a forward guidance puzzle. So forward guidance will be much less potent. And I think interesting from a policy point of view is that there are going to be state dependencies in the transmission network. So actually, quantitative tightening is not going to be minus quantitative for reasons I will explain. Now, once we have our model in place, the last thing we're going to do is we will look at the, the asymmetries that I just alluded to, and then we're going to look at the spillover. So we will consider different ways of tightening, tightening by conventional policy and tightening by uh, unconventional policy, and we'll see what the differences are domestically, and I guess we will try to convince you that they're in line with the model, and then we will we'll also look at the international spillovers. So that's the plan. If you have any questions at any point, uh, I, I forgot to put my stopwatch on. So, <laughs> okay, you have one. Very good. Uh, so please, please stop me at any point, okay? Good. So the empirics. What, what do we do? The, the latest model that we run is a monthly Bayesian local projection where you've got uh, essentially three components. You've got the constant, uh, you've got, we've got a vector of monetary policy shock, uh, a vector of 12 controls, and a potentially heteroscedastic forecast series. So let me say a little bit about each of these three components. So 
we run two sets of specifications. One, we take proxies for monetary policy shock. It's essentially Swanson's method. And that's, I think, originally we did, did it in the DR that Amina looked at. But we also look, are looking at a slight refinement of Swanson's and other paper of Daniel Lewis, which is forthcoming in Restat, which sort of breaks, breaks the implicit assumption of a constant relationship between uh, yields and shocks. Uh, something we can discuss later on. Okay, for controls, we have uh, the shops themselves, we have industrial production, PC inflation, stock returns, and an employment rate, which sort of will allow us to, to run a few sanity tests on the specification. And then our main variables of interest are going to be the term premium uh, and, and exchange rate. So that, that's all going to be there. And, and a, a nice twist, we're also going to allow for interest elasticity in the areas. So let, let's have a look at the empirical results, okay? This is focusing first on domestic transmission. So we, we see here the shocks are kind of a one standard deviation. So we didn't really normalize by anything, but I think the magnitudes for industrial production and inflation are broadly similar. So there are similarities between the policies. Okay, both of them are contractionary in terms for industrial production, uh, contractionary for inflation. So we don't really have a price puzzle initially. You get contractions in the asset market, then a rise in another point. But the difference that I want to highlight is in the dynamics of the term premium, right? So we see that on large scale asset purchases uh, actually tend to compress uh, long, 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 long term premium, sorry, in contrast to conventional policy, where the effects are in the initial quarters tends to be insignificant. Okay, so that's le lesson number one. Now, the second difference in transmission is. Um, in terms of the dynamics of the uh, equilibrium uh, of the exchange rate. So, so here we find that LSAPs uh, in the originating country lead to an appreciation, and that's in contrast to conventional policy again. So that's going to be the second source of difference in that we want the model to replicate. And then the third part, and uh, you know, we, we would have liked nicer results on the 10-year rate, but looking at the, the longer rate kind of works a little bit better is we see some evidence of these unconventional policies having a lot a, 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 a significantly positive impact on longer term yields. Okay, and that's again in contrast to conventional policy. So these three sets of qualitative differences are, are those that we want our model to replicate. In terms of international spillovers, here the stylized fact is that conventional policy so here I've highlighted advanced economies, but we've got a, we get a similar pattern also for, for the two emerging economies that we have here. The broad pattern is you, you don't really get significant effects of conventional policy abroad, but you do oops, uh, you do get them for LSATs, right? So here m m many of these panels are significantly positive. So we read that as implying but the exchange rate and term premium are the two transmission channels that are going to be important for unconventional policy, but less so for conventional policy. Sure. So is this a for Europe data? The current results are the same or it's for the US? So the, the, the results are for the US. The large economy here is the US. And uh, you know the, 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 the small open economy or the recipient economies here are the, the countries listed. The fact that it doesn't have an impact on uh, the nominal exchange rate is, uh, is a bit uh, surprising. There is this old uh, literature going to the 90s by Eichenbaum and Evans, so where they do a policy shock and they find that uh, tightening implies a very persistent uh, application of the US dollar. Okay, so. What we what we're going to find in the model is that there are exchange rate effects, but they're going to be much smaller for for the unconventional policy than for the conventional policy. So you know what I think this actually we got for both types of identified monetary policy shocks. So so that result came out robustly, uh, and, and you know these old results I think it, it's good to have them in the background. But but these identification methods have moved so far that you know even the way people were identifying shocks like ten years ago is if you talk to them and say. We don't really believe that, right? So, re re but results, you know, or, or formalized shock. We, we we know why we kind of don't don't trust those results. Is what I would say. Just the question: How did you do the normal effect of exchange rate? Was it motivated or not? Uh, uh, I, I'm not hundred percent sure, but I, I I can check it for you. So I, I think it was uh, we didn't we didn't do anything ourselves. So it was taken from one of the standard databases. So we yeah, didn't. Probably, do, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. 
So, okay, so, so these are the patterns that we look for in the model. So let me tell you a little bit about the model. Um, so essentially, at its heart, it's a very standard two-country open economy model. It, it features incomplete markets, but incompleteness is going to be kind of along more dimension than one, has home bias and consumption, sticky domestic and export prices, local currency prices. For monetary policy, in the small economy, we just assume a standard Taylor rule. The foreign economy on top is going to be additionally, additionally potentially doing QE or QT. So to allow to, to make QE or QT meaningful, we need long-term bonds. So the, the first change we do is when we introduce perpetuities modeled kind of in line with Woodford, which implies that a single parameter controls their duration, which makes it easy for us to control their duration. So we have long-term bonds. We, we need to allow the central banks to affect long-term bonds. And the mechanism we use there is borrowed from uh, Chen Kurdi and Ferrero's uh, EJ. Essentially, there, there are these transaction costs, which imply that long-term and short-term assets are going to be imperfect substitutes. Okay. So what that's going to do, it will enable the central bank to affect term premium dynamics uh, via these asset purchases. So we've got two elements of the change. The final thing we need is, is actually for these purchases of long-term assets or for these changes in asset prices to, to affect uh, real variables. So, so in a way, we need to in introduce some, some limits to arbitrage. And there, we follow the paper of Palacio and Vesovsky, which is uh, the, the 2020 JIE, which I guess is the paper most closely related to ours. And we have two types of agents, financially restricted ones, which we think of as mutual funds, which only trade in long-term bonds, and they'll have a weight of 15%. And we've got financially unrestricted agents who also trade in short-term bonds, but these unrestricted agents think of them as households. They're not really expert investors. So when they trade in long-term bonds, they will be subject to these holding costs. So that's a model in one slide. And to, I guess to understand the results that are coming really there are two uh, relationships that are key. And uh, the first is the non-arbitrage condition between long and short-term bonds. So if you, which is this equation here. So the expected return on long-term assets are gonna be related to the risk free rate or the, the one period holding returns plus these costs. And what will happen, for example, is if the central bank decides to sell assets, that's gonna be, that's gonna increase the supply of, of assets that eight private agents have to hold. And implicitly, it will force conditional this, this, this thing here being constant, it will force the expected return on long-term assets being up, uh, upwards. So if you then think of these long-term investors, uh, essentially their Euler equation works off these long-term assets. So a central bank asset sale implies an increase in the long-term rate of return. And it's going to imply that uh, you know, consumption of these restricted agents is going to go down. Sure. Just understand the asymmetry. So, so it's only the foreign country central bank that engages in QE, right? Correct. Yeah. But it's also the home country that has potentially issuing long term bonds. Uh, so, exactly. Only in the country that issues long term bonds, that, that runs QE, do we need long term bonds? All ah, right. The other one does not necessarily. No, actually, you know, we, we have long term bonds in both countries, but the central bank is just not intervening in that market. Right. Yeah. So, so this market stays as it is, and it's only like the whole. Exactly. Okay, yeah. Sure. So it sounds important here that you serve these separate agents to some degree at long and term short maturity. Yes. Because Kiwi is a swap of the two. Yes. So you're not internalizing it on a single balance sheet. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's key. And, you know, I guess you could question the mechanism. And that's why we, obviously, there are many different ways you could have introduced segmentation. In. So that, that kind of puts a question mark over the results. And that's why we think the empirical validation is important. That's why, you know, that, that's where we look for kind of reassurance. One of the things, is there any asymmetry between the dollar and the other currency? Does the like financially constrained agent borrow in dollars and do a carry trade or something, and that matters? Or mm, no, well, uh, the asymmetry is going to be in, in the size of the two economies. So, so the dollar economy is going to be much larger. That's going to be the key, right? Okay. So the second relationship is uh, essentially we, we get a long-term UIP condition, right? So returns on expected returns on long-term bonds. Are related to returns on foreign long term bonds and the expected depreciation. And that will matter for our spillover results. So essentially, uh, you can, we know that the exchange rate of the country implementing will tend to appreciate on, on impact. So, kind of the burden of, of adjustment, it will be split between the exchange rate and the long term interest rate. So, uh, I'll show you some results about countries that are pegging. So, if you're pegging, you're shutting this down, you're going to get one to one transmission from 
domestic to foreign long-term rates and premia, but under a standard Taylor rule. So the, the Taylor rule or foreign the recipient country monetary policy will be will determine the exact split. And under a standard Taylor rule, we kind of get a 100 basis point domestic to, to 35 uh, basis point in the recipient country. That's going to be how international transmission works in the baseline version of the model. Sure. Did you check uh, deviations of UIP in the data? Uh, of, so, so again, to... uh, deviations of UIP in the data, because you have the shock and then you can construct a proxy so, or, or, or expectations and then see if UIP holds. That's another test uh, of the model. I, I, I agree. I think that's a good one. I was thinking the exact same thing. So we could see how well this, this long-term relationship performs. Apparently not something we've done yet, but uh, I, I appreciate the suggestion. So there is no short-term UIP? So the, the, there is a the short term UIP is going to be distorted by these holding costs. So you will see similar types of relationship, but, but they're going to be muted. So you will see these changes in the long term rates. I mean, you still have these non arbitrage relationships, and these costs are not going to be, you know, uh, are still relatively small. So they're not going to dominate it, but it's not going to be a clean short term UIP. Okay. Sure. What about country risk premium? Can we show the short term UIP condition? Uh, so, so essentially, the you know we you could well we the model is certainly equivalent. So we we don't really have proper risk premium, if you like. You could think of these wedges as a proxy for the risk premium. That's that's one way of putting. It, okay, but it's you know I I know there are some people who would object to calling these wedges term term premium. So that's a separate discussion. Okay. So oh, sorry. sure. You say you can construct a short term UIP, but the, are the agents allowed to trade internationally the short term bonds? No. So the short term bonds are not traded internationally, okay. but, but those markets are segmented. But the guys who can't, who can, the, 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 the unrestricted agents who can hold short term bonds, they can, they can trade in long term bonds. So, so in essence, it's going to work for long term bonds, but it won't, you, you're not going to get full transmission to the short term rates. Okay. That's good. Okay. Um, okay. In terms of monetary policy, we have a standard Taylor rule, zero lower bound. And we sort of assume that the, the standard monetary policy is, is the instrument of choice in that when you specify the rule for unconventional monetary policy, it doesn't really respond to, to conditions. It's kind of discretionary and persistent. So we allow that we assume that the central bank buys assets and then sort of allows them to roll off its balance sheet unless you know another discretionary shock occurs. So if you thought, you know, that, that uh, so, so we know that different rules for QE could really matter here, but that's not something we uh, investigate. Okay, so what we do to, anyway, we differentiate our model from uh, last time. So what's we allow for a little bit of uh, behavioral discounting on like GAPEX, which effectively kills the forward guidance puzzle, which I'll show you. And we have a banana shaped Phillips curve, courtesy of the work that Jesper and Coopers did. And that would imply that there are these asymmetries in transmission that, uh, depending on what point you, you conduct policy, is going to matter. Calibration is set in line with extant papers and kind of motivated by both empirical evidence. And I'm not going to say, I'm not going to pretend by, by the local projection results that you've just seen, since these results are new, but we will be, you know, we will be reconciling the, the, the model with those uh, more closely. And I guess in terms of the QE multipliers, which are, you know, you probably might wonder about what we currently have built in is that a 1.75% seller for central bank bond holdings kind of does an order of magnitude less to, to output and, and there are persistent increases in long risk. So, um, and as I mentioned, we, we have a bit model is certainly equivalent, but we saw it non linearly to account for these uh, effects of the, the Kimball aggregation. Okay, so let, let's have a look at the domestic transmission. So the first exercise we do is we, we take the model, we standardize by assuming a, a 10 basis point reaction of the nominal interest rate, and we look at what quantitative tightening does and relative to, to conventional monetary policy. So the first thing you see is that, uh, you know, the, the reaction and output and inflation for a given uh, response of the nominal um, interest rate is much smaller for quantitative least. So we think this is actually, in light of these new empirical evidence, we think this is a little bit too small. The, it's, it's, what it's regulated by in the model is the share of the restricted agents. So, so to, to beef it up, we will need some more restricted agents. That's what we have in there at the moment. The, 
Second, well, you, you can obviously see that the term premium responds much more under unconventional policy. If we, we, we say that the real exchange rate responds more to unconventional monetary policy, and I guess to better get a better sense of that, so here it kind of looks broadly in line, but if you think about blowing up these impulse responses, and if we normalize by output and inflation, you can imagine that the real exchange rate response in terms of QE would really kind of dominate the one we see for conventional monetary policy. So these two channels, the term premium and the real exchange rate, are, are really where you get big differences between conventional and unconventional policy. Sure. I saw in the data you showed that there is no impact on the nominal exchange rate, and given that prices are sticky, so there shouldn't be an impact on uh, the real exchange rate, right? Yet the model is predicting a very strong appreciation. Sure. Okay. So imagine, so, so the, the impulse, so this impulse response is around the tenth of this. So if, if you imagine increasing the shock, the unconventional shock, that you get similar responses on output and inflation, because that's sort of the empirical exercise we're doing, right? If you, if, if I was to quickly go back to, well, which, which I'm not going to, to the, those impulse responses, the, the one standard deviation of quantitative easing shock did, 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 had a similar effect on inflation and output. So if you did that, you so imagine multiplying the green line by 10, then you would have a roughly sevenfold larger impact of unconventional on uh, real exchange rate. So you still have an impact of conventional monetary policy on the exchange rate. So that's not exactly in line with the model, right? I mean, it's not exactly zero, but it's much, much smaller is what, is, is what the model is telling relative to unconventional policy. Does that make sense? Yeah, but uh, I, I think it's still a larger impact of conventional monetary policy. The model is telling us on exchange rates. So that's that's not consistent with the data. No, so so okay. So what I'm trying to say is about conditional. So here we're normalizing by the response. No, no, you, you understand. That, so, yeah, so, understand so, so we're normalizing by a different thing than we normalize in the empirical exercise. So if we were to normalize by output, you would need to multiply this green line by like 10 times, right? And then, you know, then the green line would go to minus 10 or 12, whereas the blue line would go to minus one. So you'd have a 10, 10 times larger impact of unconventional policy on the exchange rate. Okay, so much, much larger. Okay, a any other questions? So this is ju just very briefly showing you, this is this is showing the forward guidance of getting the model. So the, the green line shows the, you know, so, so we have, here we're starting to look at a baseline scenario, which is meant to proxy COVID. And you see, and we're looking at how efficient the two tools are. So forward guidance promising to commit to holding rates lower for three years, longer per gram, does a little bit, but it's nowhere near as potent as in the standard model. In contrast, you know, QE of the of the sides that we've seen in the data actually is, is a lot more potent, there's a lot more inflation in our. The second thing that I promised to show you is the asymmetry between QE and QT. Okay, so essentially there are going to be two reasons why QE and uh, minus QT are different. One is that QE is conducted in a liquidity trap, so you're constraining the nominal interest rate and unable to respond. That kind of mechanically gives you, in part, a larger response on, of output. The other, so you know. If you were to mechanically translate it to inflation, you would expect similar inflation responses. But here's where Kimball kicks in. So Kimball implies that the slope of the Phillips curve in an economic slump is much flatter um, when you're conducting QE than in QE. So because of that, what the model's telling you, that the effects on inflation of the two policies are going to be comparable, even though there is actually this large threefold disparity in terms of their effects on output. So the only source of asymmetry is the lack of a response by the central bank. Okay. So that's about 50%. The other 50% is the fact that the Phillips curve is nonlinear. So if, if you if we were to, to add a third line, you would, you would kind of see the decomposition. So it's it's sort of 50-50. 50. That's it. Which right? Uh, what are you using as a lens? Uh, 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 of the differences. So, so in output. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So how am I doing on time? Pretty well. So let's say two to four minutes. Okay. Uh, that translates into pretty terrible. <laughs> given what to, to, to tell you about it. Okay. So here we're starting to look at spillovers. And when looking at spillovers, what we have is, so we have that baseline scenario, just kind of think of the COVID shock, that's the blue line. So what we layer on top 
is we want to have these unanticipated cost push shock, but push inflation up, but certainly out the broadly in line with where it was. So it's a kind of a very stylized way to, to think of the post COVID surge in inflation. And so, so here's a source economy that will be potentially running different policies. And, and the recipient here is, is the uh, advanced economy. Okay, so but importantly, for what I'm going to tell you, the shock is assumed largely asymmetric. Okay, so it, it mainly hits the, the large economy. So, okay, so one thing that you, you're going to figure out, you know, both output and inflation over shoes. So, in some sense, for monetary policy, there's going to be low hanging fruit. Tightening faster and by more is going to be a good policy, a welfare improving policy, but there are two ways of doing it. One is you can sell off long term bonds. And, and have a smaller policy hike. The other is to hold QE to maturity, but, but hike rates by more. So I'm, I'm going to show you the effect of these policies. And also then we're going to look at how the exchange rate regime of the recipient country matters. Okay. For, for the spillovers, the important parts of the calibration is the uh, economy doing QT is going to be large, 99%. It's uh, the Foreign, the recipient economy is relatively open, uh, trade share of 25%. And the different, I'll show you AE and EME results. The main difference between AEs and EMEs will be that EMEs have much higher pass through to in, in exchange rate pass through to inflation. So that's going to create uh, a sort of tougher policy trade off in line with some of our other work. So here, is, is what happened to the policy instrument. So the three lines, the, the red line is sort of the baseline you, should, you, you saw with the shock. So that's kind of the, the standard Taylor rule. The green line here corresponds to a much faster bond sell-off and that allows you to keep nominal interest rates for longer. And then the blue line is you hike sooner and you hike it by a bit more. In all the other panels, I, I'm only showing the, going to focus on deviations of the blue from the red and of the green from the, the red. So as you can see, we've, calibrated these two policies or, uh, to, to ensure that broadly the respect, both of them achieve a similar effect on output and inflation. And you immediately see, kind of in terms of domestic transmission, that QE has a much larger effect on uh, long-term yields, okay? So when we look at what happens to an advanced economy, we, we see that, again, the, the two channels we're talking about, so there's a transmission by the exchange rate, much, much more intensive under QE, and by the long term, longer term premium. Okay, so so essentially for advanced economies, you, you see so, somewhat larger effects, somewhat larger negative spillovers of unconventional policy. But things really start looking dire if you focus on the emerging market economy. You have similar exchange rate movements, but they actually translate into much larger inflationary pressures. These larger inflationary pressures merit much larger interest rate hikes. And so you end up with considerably lower uh, emerging market output in this simulation. Okay, that, that's under flexible inflation targeting. So where I'm going to finish, the last thing I wanted to show you is how this emerging market picture changes if you're a pegger instead. Okay, so if you're a pegger, we assume you're pegging the nominal exchange rate. So if there's markedly less real exchange rate dynamics, right? And we see that under the, because if, if you recall kind of the decomposition adjustment can happen either by the exchange rate or the, the, the term premium. So because you're, you're fixing the exchange rate, you get much larger response of emerging market economy long rates, which feeds into kind of like the, the channel we discussed with Paolo, also into a much higher path of the short rate. So what that translates to under quantitative easing is massive output and uh, inflation losses relative to flexible inflation targeting. Okay, so it's kind of uh, quantitative, and you know you have an element that both for conventional tightening, which is in the right column, and for quantitative easing, but but quantitatively it's much larger for quantitative easing. And I guess you could say that, you know, in, in one sentence, what that illustrates is that pegging when you have asymmetric shocks is a really costly policy. And, and it's going to be a particularly costly policy when you've got to do much more to stabilize the exchange rate, which is going to be the case under quantitative easing. Okay, so uh, that brings me to the end of my time. So really the three takeaways is that we find evidence of differences in propagation between QE and QT and uh, uh, conventional policy. 
I, I showed you that we, we kind of identify larger uh, effects of QE on uh, domestic output relative to QE because of uh, uh, these two effects, because of the ZLD and because of Kimball. And taken together, what our results imply is that we would expect significantly larger spillovers of uh, kind of balance sheet shrinkages relative to conventional policy. So in some sense, you know, perhaps the resilience of the emerging market economies that was mentioned in the panel before, well, could be in, in part reflecting the fact that we haven't really seen these balance sheets starting to shrink at pace, at least according to the model. Thank you. Um, thank you, everyone. My name is Amina. I'm from Bank of Canada. And thank you, Powell and Thomas, for inviting me to discuss the paper. Uh, this is a very interesting paper uh, where they, in a nutshell, the question asks, like, what are the impacts of uh, domestic transmission and international spillovers from the quantitative easing and quantitative tightening relative to uh, conventional monetary policy. And what they find is that uh, QT tends to have a, a small effect on output while they have a larger effect on the exchange rate. And at the same time, there is some asymmetry between asset sales and asset purchases, depending on the state-dependent Phillips curve. And uh, I have to say that uh, I work on unconventional, sorry, monetary policy transmission to mortgage rates. So the paper was looking to exchange rates and output from a very different approach. And it was a very, I learned a lot by reading it. Um, in the paper, the main uh, ingredients of the key model ingredients were that households are myopic where uh, through this assumption, uh, their consumption is less sensitive to the uh, future path of policy rates. Secondly, uh, their uh, aggregator for the perfectly competitive final goods producers are now Kimball, where during the recession, when there's a quantitative easing, the aggregator will have a more effect on output and inflation because of this uh, low uh, slope of the Phillips curve while it is the opposite in the quantitative tightening uh, due to this uh, steep of the Phillips curve. And the message was that, that there is an asymmetry between asset purchase and asset sales. And the interaction between the Kimball aggregator and then the households being myopic uh, plays a role for this uh, monetary announcements. The mechanism that they talk about is that there's some lack of substitute between short and long term bonds due to this portfolio transaction costs. And these costs are affected by the quantitative easing, and this will affect the outstanding supply of bonds uh, and then uh, affect the monetary policy transmission. So, the comments that I wanted to make today uh, was that. The paper uh, focused on this long-term UIP condition, looking at the long-term interest rate differential. Their main uh, ingredient is that the Kimball parameter and then cognitive discounting where households being myopic. And uh, in this literature, a lot of uh, papers focus on the saver side. Uh, and then my question was that, what about on the borrower side? What about borrower's mortgage rate channel? Because QE1 and QE3 were buying a lot of mortgage-backed securities as opposed to uh, treasury securities. So I think it is an important aspect to look into. And if you look across the years of the foreign holdings of long-term US treasury 
and then short-term US Treasury relative to the mortgage-backed securities that they are holding relative to the US GDP, uh, mortgage-backed securities tend to have a big or like as big as impact as the short-term uh, Treasury. So I think it'd be interesting to include the mortgage-backed securities. And uh, if we look at the impact of Q1 and QT on the emerging market economies, it also tends to have an impact, a larger impact on the two-year and 10-year treasury yields in terms of the basis point. Um, so yeah, again, I'm emphasizing that the purchase of this uh, MBSs would have an impact on the emerging market economies. Uh, the next exercise that I do uh, is that I look into uh, uh, quantitative easing and quantitative tightening uh, looking at uh, monetary policy shock from the Swanson 2021 paper and look at the U.S. mortgage rates. Uh, these are all 30-year fixed rate uh, mortgages, how they respond to a different uh, QQT technique. So my time period is uh, from 2009 to 2019, where 2009 to 2015 is uh, considered as the QE. And then 2017 to 2019 is considered as uh, QT. And I understand there's a small time variation. Uh, and at the same time, I control for credit score and loan to value ratio. And some like a preliminary result shows me that the, during the quantitative tightening, banks were increasing the mortgage rates, while during the quantitative easing, they uh, declined their uh, mortgage rates. And this indicates that through this uh, QE effect, uh, because now mortgage rates are lower, households have more consumption. Uh, so then, which would furthermore affect your output economy in the US. Mm. The last exercise, I think, yeah, the last exercise I do in the discussion is that, okay, what about the spillover effect across country? So then I look at the European mortgage market and then again, look into this uh, QE, QT, the time period, 20, 2009 to 2016 and 2017 to 2019. And then uh, controlling, looking into a five-year fixed rate, uh, sorry, five-year uh, mortgages in uh, Europe uh, seems to show me that in the beginning, they uh, uh lowering their mortgage rates, but uh, over time it has an insignificant effect. While under the QT spillover effect, it was rising, but over time it becomes statistically insignificant. So my point here is that, yes, the uh, mortgage rate channel seems to be an, one of the important factors that you could uh, incorporate. Um, some of the minor comments that I wanted to see was that uh, I would like to see like a first order conditions that emphasizes your Kimball parameter and cognitive discounting, how it is like innovates relative to your other literature uh, so that I can, or readers can see like which mechanism and which uh, equations are driving the main results. Uh, some of the sensitivity analysis could be done in the model is that, um, now there's some transaction costs are uh, constant when they, so portfolio transaction cost is constant, but could the portfolio transaction cost also depends on this uh, state dependency. Uh, the second uh, exercise that could be done was that um, during uh, QE, okay, so during quantitative technique, uh, there was a flight to safety to the US, uh, so which could be captured by the risk aversion parameter in the model versus um, U.S. investors searching for yields in the emerging markets. And then this could be maybe captured through the lower term premium in the transaction cost. Uh, and I think you have mentioned already, but uh, I wanted to see like fixed and flexible exchange rate uh, uh, when they use the monetary policy, what kind of equation they use. And then uh, the consideration of like when there is a credit boom and asset bubbles in the emerging countries, how do they interact with the monetary policy, as well as during the quantitative tightening when money flies out, 
how does the fire sale also feed into this uh, exchange rate transmission? And uh, lastly, um, I would like to maybe the newer version have it, but uh, there's a could be interesting uh, uh, calibration tables based on advanced economy and emerging economies, as well as the figures would show uh, how they respond instead of in one country. Uh, so this uh, overall, I really enjoyed this uh, paper. It's very interesting, thought provoking, and a very timely uh, and it's an important contribution to the literature. I encourage everyone to uh, read this, and I learned a lot uh, from a different approach. And thank you for inviting me to the talk. We would like to have the audience for questions. Uh, so maybe you can discuss them like in open yeah. the general conference sure. later on. If there are any questions from the audience, thank you. I have one. Sure. Yes. That's for understanding. So you mentioned like these QE or QT sharks are relatively persistent. And like and now your IRS, I saw they were rarely going down. What's the reason for this going down? Because you have positive inflation or so there are two two things. So in what we assume for the QE, what we're trying to, to proxy is kind of the, the rate of rollover of these assets that you expect. So if you have 10 year assets and kind of if you expect that, you know, all of them were initially 10 year, but you have a balanced portfolio of them, a chunk of them is going to mature and, and fall off your balance sheet. So the speed of decline, most of that was trying to, 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 to capture that. On top of which, because I was showing you kind of real QE holdings, yes. even if we, so, so inflation is doing a little bit on top, but most of the, the downward trend, that was uh, kind, kind of assets maturing and, and kind of endogenously or exogenously falling off the, the central bank's balance sheet. Yes, I see. Just so you stress uh, uh, the discounting to, to kill uh, and to solve the global guidance puzzle. Why is that important for your result? What would you lose if you don't have that? I think so. The reason we're stressing it, so it's not first order important. We think it makes for a nicer story that we have a model that doesn't have the forward guidance puzzle. If you, at the end of the day, the question is why, why did central banks do QE in the first place? So this model, they had a reason to do QE. If you have a, a model in which kind of the forward guidance puzzle is alive and kicking, you essentially don't need to do QE at all. You've got a better tool in forward guidance, so why not just use that? And so I guess, the, you know, the, we were slightly reassured that we have a model in which it actually makes sense to do QE. And, and that, that's kind of why, why, why we, we tweaked along that dimension. Okay. Uh, I have one, uh, one comment. Okay. The QE or QT. So it's a QT. Uh, many people is very surprised in that. So it's a 2009. So it's a very high impact to uh, exchange uh, late. So, but in the QT, so it's a uh, we are more uh, it, uh, introduced adapting so uh, what guidance etc. So it's uh, another show is uh, very viral. So this is uh, how the impact is uh, very slow. And uh, I'm uh, another thing is uh, is a uh, how uh, it's a uh, household on on consumption etc. So it's uh, uh, oh okay. So this is a pretty good idea. Thank you. No, so uh, I, I agree. So I think we could, I, I think we're still, but I don't think, you know, and, and that, that was highlighted by Lori in her discussion. I, I think, you know, there are, there's a wide variety of different expectations as to how QT would unwind. So even though these assets have been purchased, I don't think people are still clear on what exactly is going to happen and whether, and, you know, certainly if you read, read uh, there's a number of recent policymakers' speeches in which we're speculating about kind of accelerating the pace. So, I would argue that there's still considerable uncertainty around QT, but arguably, you know, ahead of, you know, before QE was introduced at all, you could argue that that information on top was larger. That's probably not something that we, we have in the model. So the asymmetries we have are not due to, uh, to one policy being more surprising than the other, if you like. Okay. Thank you very much again for your contribution and the discussion. And I will directly move over to my presentation here. And I will add another layer to this discussion, namely uh, basically what uh, a specific currency trading strategy 
um, impose a, yeah, will, how this affects actually the transmission of monitor policy. Um, this is very much work in progress. And my colleague Alina, she's from finance. This is the first time I was working together with a colleague from finance. And so probably you have seen it in the paper that we are not really sure if it's fully an economics paper or finance paper. So that's um, why I appreciate every comment you will have. Um, the usual disclaimer applies here. Uh, let me start also with two uh, motivational figures. The first one is uh, basically the change in interest rate differentials relative to the US versus the exchange rate appreciation versus the uh, US dollar. And you see two colors here, uh, and they refer to different periods. So basically, the red color is uh, from 1980, uh, from 89 till 2000, and this is from 2003 to 2006. And what we uh, know from theory, basically standard theory, is that the monetary policy tightening um, leads to an appreciation of the domestic currency. Uh, well, here you see basically two different slopes, not only magnitude, but also uh, in sign, uh, more importantly. And um, that might have a lot of reasons, um, different macroeconomic fundamentals, um, faster pace of tightening, um, and so on. And what we argue in this paper is that actually, um, when you conduct monetary policy, you do not only reveal or you do not only set interest rates or conventional monetary um, policy uh, tools you apply, but also some kind of information that you reveal during your policy announcements. And these uh, information shocks, how we deem it, um, might have a different uh, effect on um, exchange rates. And the second point here is it's always vis-a-vis uh, -vis the US um, dollar because the US dollar is, uh, has a special role uh, in the global financial system. So this is the first thing um, I want to mention here. Uh, the second is actually, I'm sorry, I just forgot to set the timer. Uh, I don't want to uh, <laughs> spend much of your time. So uh, yeah. Uh, going back to the second thing here is, um, again, the interest rate differential uh, over uh, the, the period of 2000 to um, 2020 um, and the net open interest. And this measure here is a measure for carry trade activity. Um, it says uh, it's based on uh, outstanding currency derivatives. And if this is a positive measure, uh, we have... Um, an overhang of investors that actually sell US dollar. And when this is negative, we have an overhang of investors that actually buy US dollar. Yes, please. Sorry, I think I probably missed it. What was the color of the left? Uh, this one? Yeah. Yes, I, I'm sorry. So this is the period from uh, 1980, uh, oh, okay. uh, 89 to 2000, and this is 2003 to 2006. Both are actually uh, Fed tightening episodes. Yeah. I'm sorry, I missed that. Yeah. Um, Exactly, and here you see basically a very strong positive correlation uh, between this measure of carry trade and um, uh, the interest rate differential, which is not surprising, uh, basically as the carry trade is basically exploiting the interest rate differential. But just, just to understand the risk, yes. so I mean, the, there's always two counterparts, right? So, so it's like from this perspective of the, the other country or where, I mean... This is always vis-a-vis uh, -vis the US dollar. Yeah, but I mean, are there like uh, either uh, intermediaries in the US that are holding the other side of the derivative? Uh, yes. In yes. some sense, yeah, it, say it, it means somebody has to have the other Exactly. Side so um, that's a good point, actually. Um, yeah, it, it must be the case, actually, because uh, uh, that uh, the dealers are holding, actually. Uh, I'm not sure, but the, globally, it, they have to cancel out, right? It says like this it, it has to, to net out, yeah. So. That's uh, so that's a good point. Just to understand, like, yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, yeah. We we interpret it as uh, as a as a carry trade measure. So if it's if it's um, far away from zero, then we have a lot of carry trades. So open outstanding um, um, uh, uh, contracts okay. and so uh, like cross. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And here it's netted out. It's long minus short over the uh, total um, uh, outstanding amount. Exactly. Um, what we're doing in this paper, uh, or what we're aiming to do, is basically uh, to put both things together. So uh, we, we we want to check what the import uh, the impact of U.S. monetary and information shocks 
is on a broad set of currency is a the US dollar. So this is the first stage where we have a linear model. And then to take into account this character activity, uh, we actually um, uh, estimate a nonlinear model, a threshold model, to actually check how this activity is affecting uh, the interest rate, uh, the, the, the currency dynamics here. And then we try to exploit this information for a, a trading exercise, but I'm afraid I won't have too much time to go too deep into this. Can I just think uh, yeah. on the biggest uh, dividend plan and uh, yes. you average across time, right? Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah it's, it's it's just the, the and the, in the left hand side instead you speak across the two exactly. So, fine. Yeah. so it's kind of average. Exactly. So yeah, it's it's just the motivation here uh, will be uh, a bit more precise uh, during the critical um, analysis here. Um, what do we use? Basically, we use as a uh, first step uh, a linear VR model uh, to 31 currencies, uh, advanced and emerging currencies. And uh, to analyze the second part here, we use the threshold VR model. I will come to that in a second. Uh, and also, um, uh, yeah, uh, uh, extensive trading uh, exercise uh, where we try to outperform a benchmark portfolio. Um, short on the related literature, we are tackling three strands of literature. The first one is uh, quite popular in, in economics. It's the distinction between monetary policy shocks and information shocks. Uh, here we have a specific uh, focus on currency markets. The second is a little bit more in the finance perspective. So what is the role of currency carry trades for FX dynamics? Here you have a, a, this, this paper by Markus Bonemeyer, who actually argued that um, uh, um, yeah, a lot of carry trades put some kind of instability in the system because if a monetary policy shock occurs, um, traders have to unwind the positions quickly and that could lead actually to a, a sudden devaluation. And finally, as we bench, as we use uh, the U.S. dollar as a um, uh, as a uh, counterparty currency here, um, this basically summarizes that there is some something special uh, of the role of the U.S. dollar. So I have to define um, two concepts here. Basically, the first one is carry trade. Uh, I'll be quickly on that. This uh, is a trading strategy where you borrow. In a, low yielding currency and invest in a high yielding currency. Uh, so basically you use the UIP violation, uh, you exploit that. The premise for profit is that you first have a non-trivial interest rate differential. And the second one is that you have a stable and not very uh, appreciating funding currency. Um, when we look at uh, FX markets here, uh, markets here uh, we find several anomalies. So for instance, that you have a this connect thing that the, the, the um, macroeconomic fundamentals are not really uh, able to explain uh, FX uh, um, dynamics, that you have skewness in, in FX returns, that you have fat tails and so on. Um, our hypothesis here is that the, the, the monetary policy uh, and information shocks um, affect uh, fixed markets with opposite signs. And the, the core idea is that shocks are per se not uh, anticipated. So that means if a shock hits the system, the traders need quickly to unwind the positions to limit losses. And if this appears, uh, uh, and if everyone is doing that, basically we have here a sudden currency revaluation uh, or even a currency crash. This is exactly what Bruno Meyer 2008 uh, um, uh, imposes here. And this resembles somewhat the saying among traders up by the stairs and then down by the elevator. The second thing is we are not using a standard, um, a standard, um, a standard economic uh, model like a Taylor rule model or a monetary model to model the um, spot rate here, but we have a cash flow view, and this is taken from the famous Jan Krishnamurti and the Lustig paper in Journal of Finance 2021, and they show actually first theoretically and then empirically that. A nominal exchange rate of a safe asset currency can be, be decomposed into three, uh, basically three blocks. So this is standard interest rate differential, the risk premium, and the convenience yield. And this is the, the core of our story here. Um, a convenience yield um, appears if you have a safe and liquid asset. So investors are willing to forego some return of the bond yields to hold these assets. And in this paper, uh, the authors showed actually 
that the convenience yield gap is proportional to, a to the treasury basis. And the treasury basis is the difference between the yield on a cash position in US treasuries and the synthetic dollar yield uh, in a foreign bond, which is then hedged back to the US. And that's uh, something um, they showed very nicely. Um, uh, and uh, that's what we are going to use in our uh, next model step here. Um, you will see actually in the vector of endogenous variable we use for the VR, uh, these uh, variables stemming from the previous um, definition, and we had two more. This is exactly the core of our identification of monetary policy shocks and information shocks. Um, so our uh, identification rests on the insights of Yaroshinsky and Kahazi 2020, uh, 20, uh, which is basically uh, uh, a two-step procedure uh, consisting of a high-frequency identification and sign restrictions. So to get these surprises, uh, they look at the narrow window around FOMC um, announcements and check uh, how uh, uh, interest uh, rate derivatives react in this tiny window. And based on that, they yeah, construct these surprise series. They do the same for the S&P 500, the first step. And uh, then they, uh, they, they uh, sum it up to, to monthly frequency. And the distinction between how to identify uh, both of them is you exploit the co-movement. Cool so if you have a positive co-movement, cool that means uh, this surprise is positive and this surprise is positive. You have an information shock. So basically, this is something happening during the FOMC meeting that uh, the FOMC reveals some information the public uh, did not have before. Um, if this is uh, basically a, a negative co-movement, so this goes up and this goes down, this is a classical monetary policy shock, basically. Uh, the, the, the stock market reacts negatively. Uh, we do that for 10 developed market and 21 emerging market currencies vis-a-vis um, -vis the US dollar. Um, unfortunately, we have this net open interest uh, variable only for eight currencies. So the nonlinear model uh, is only applied to these eight currencies. And this is measured by the net, so this is the long minus short uh, future positions of non-commercial traders. And um, I received the comment that actually, uh, why not use the forward premium here uh, to measure um, uh, the currency, uh, the, the carry trade activity, because here it's actually really the trades that stand behind that. And this is exactly the summary of the identification of our monetary policy uh, shock thing here. Um, as I said, it rests on the, the, the work uh, by Marek and Peter here. Can I ask? Of course. Uh, is this daily data or? Daily data? Yeah. Uh, what is the frequency of the data? Exactly. Uh, we have monthly monthly frequency, yeah. and the high frequency identification is based on, on intraday yeah. in this tiny window, and then they aggregate it. And then they uh, aggregate it. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, basically, we exploit this uh, co movement between these two surprises to identify and separate. Monitor policy and information shocks. And the the uh, you mean now this uh, this one, two, three, this one yeah this one yeah this is also a monthly data okay. yeah so everything is on uh, runs on monthly in frequency because you have the data exactly yes yes so this is also available on the data exactly yeah, yeah. yes yes so that's basically the that's basically the, the, the proxy uh, used by Unamai and, and, and co-authors. And they also write it's not a perfect yeah. representation, but basically this is what we uh, we have at the moment. But if you have any other suggestions, I'm, I'm very happy to hear because we're still missing a robustness section. Yeah, I may really be wrong on this, but I remember that they are reported in the trade in the trade the traders' commitment, both futures and options. So you have a combination, you have two different records. We need to run on this, but for the commodities, that's the case. Yeah. So, 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 so. Okay, thanks a lot.
I'm going to uh, the empirical strategy here. Um, I just show you this threshold VR because we are, uh, I'm a bit short on time here. And you see, this is the vector of endogenous variables here. Um, in, we have three regimes and this net open interest rate, uh, this net open interest um, is, uh, is basically our threshold variable. Well, what we do here is uh, we have, we come up with three regimes. Um, in each regime, we have a linear VR. But the coefficients or the dynamics in each regime is different. Uh, the same uh, holds true for the variance covariance matrix. And in our interpretation, um, actually, this regime, so if the cu currency is in this regime here, it serves as a funding currency. And here is an investment currency. And here we interpret this as a regime of indeterminacy where we cannot be uh, sure about that. Uh, these uh, parameters, uh, gamma uh, one and gamma two, are latent threshold parameters. So basically, we do not set them, we estimate them from the data. Uh, we use Bayesian techniques here, but I will spare you the details uh, unless you're interested in that, uh, because, it, because it's, uh, uh, it involves a little bit uh, uh, computation to, to, to come up with the proper posterior here. We use two legs. Uh, to minimize the dimension of the system. And uh, yeah, that's basically the, the empirical strategy. Let me directly jump to the first uh, results based on the linear model. It's kind of tedious to present 31 impulse response functions. That's why we uh, agreed to just show you the maximum re responses after restrictive shuffle. So basically we looked at the impulse response functions, then we checked at which period in time uh, the, 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 the maximum uh, response happened. And that's what we plot here along with the confidence bounds. And we see that with the monitor policy shock, everything is like we should expect it from theory. Basically, we have uh, an US dollar appreciation uh, against almost all currencies after a monetary policy shock. But if we go to an information shock, we see, well, a considerable. Uh, 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 deep appreciation here. Um, what we argue at the moment is uh, that the difference in, in reaction here is mostly due to the uh, currency's uh, characteristics, um, which could also stem from, from its attractiveness uh, to carry trades um, thing here. Uh, the, the, the conclusion from this slide is basically that the exchange rate channel does not only transmit monitor policy shocks, but also information shocks. Okay, question, just a presentation. Yeah. The whiskers are the uh, uh, Exactly. So if you if you imagine the, the impulse response function, you have the confidence bounds here, the 68. So you can do since you have several reactions, you do similar things, and instead of putting the maximum with the whiskers, you put the I don't know the average and then the maximum you leave. And this is going to provide you some dispersion this, in the reaction. Yeah. Why across that's the a good, uh, to, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, because this was also a comment we received that we basically miss a lot of information here. Uh, but yeah, that's for the time we have that. But thanks, that's that's a, a good idea to include all the information because 31 impulse response functions are hard to I mean, sell. Exactly. Uh, but thanks again. The second one. Uh, in this the, the, the second uh, result here is the regime allocation. So basically, we can we estimate the threshold uh, the thresholds um, gamma one and gamma two, basically spanning the three regimes, and we see that this is kind of heterogeneous across our eight currencies here, and also in terms of descriptive statistics, they vary considerably. Uh, across the regimes, uh, especially so my colleague is uh, interested in the skewness. Uh, the skewness is very different whether a, a currency is a funding um, a currency or investment currency in the carry trade. The second uh, uh, thing here, so now you have two colors. The, the black color is associated with uh, 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 with the currency being uh, an, an investment currency and the blue one uh, as a funding currency. Um, 
uh, the other way around, sorry, funding is uh, black and uh, investment is blue. And now we have this tiny numbers here where we see when the, the period, uh, in, in which period actually the maximum risk uh, happens. So the number indicates the respective month. And uh, what we see is that during for, for monetary policy shocks, typical funding currencies like the, the, the yen, the, the Swiss franc, and the, the, the euro show different reactions when being an investment currency. So basically, that's that's uh, what we see here uh, it becomes insignificant, and um, typical investment currencies here they react also different to the monetary policy shock. Then the second panel here is the information shock. Um, the typical investment currencies here on the right-hand side show a pronounced appreciation when used as an investment currency. Um, and that points on and confirms somewhat what Bonemeyer uh, proposed or found that actually the, the currency uh, carry trade activity um, yeah, brings in some instability uh, due to to monetary policy uh, shocks, actually. Can I ask just another yes. quick, quick yeah, question? Go ahead, please. So my understanding is that you treat one currency as funding or investing across time. You cannot change the status. You get one gamma one and one gamma two. No, no. This mm. Exactly. So basically, uh, a currency can be at one point in time, either uh, in each regime. So either a funding currency, not sure, and uh, uh, an investment currency that can vary over time. Okay. And so that's why we can say um, that typical funding currencies and typical investment currencies react differently when they are used the other way around. That's that's what we can achieve with this model. Thank you for the, for the question. Yeah, but the gamma is specific. Exactly. So we don't have, we, it's currency specific. Currency. Exactly. So we have for each, Currency, we ran the model for each currency. Yes. So there is no international dimension in, in that sense. Um, yeah, well, then going back to the, the first linear uh, exercise, and I will be quick on that. Uh, we use the information, or we use the knowledge about information shocks and monetary policy shocks to construct uh, uh, portfolios. Uh, the first one is a carry trade portfolio, and this is uh, based on the dollar strategy. So this is a conventional strategy where you basically sell the US dollar and buy all other currencies. And the time of portfolio reshuffling is either end of month, yeah, based on the announcement. And the green line is basically we use the information of being an info, uh, monetary policy shock or um, uh, an information shock. Uh, to reshuffle our portfolio. And here you see basically that we outperform over time. So this is the cumulative return. Um, the strategies when we use basically also the, 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 the nature of the shock. And another thing I want to highlight for the conventional dollar strategy here is that we do not see the dip during the financial crisis. So basically we, we, we're much smoother in terms of uh, cumulative returns, and we can uh, outperform all the other portfolios also in terms of sharp ratio and all other metrics you want to consider uh, in, in, in checking how your uh, portfolio is doing, actually. So do, do you have an intuition why the green line just sort of takes the others right and you don't have to do you think that that other? Um, well, of... well, actually, I'm, I'm not sure. Maybe. One has to look uh, if there is an, an overhang of uh, information shocks, but it's a good point actually. So we're still uh, in, in describing and uh, looking into the dynamics here. And in the end, we we were interested actually in, in just uh, uh, yeah how taking this information into account outperforms over time, so it's, it's a cumulative return. What were these strategies implementable in real time? So did you, or are the shots constructed from knowing the whole sample? So uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, basically, I'm not sure. So you have to observe. So basically, you have the shock information then only when it occurs. And that's, yeah. 
Okay, so this is just the, 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 the performance numbers. And yeah, let me briefly conclude. So we, as I said, it's still work in progress. Uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, outcomes here, and uh, I think we need to streamline it uh, to, a, to a coherent story. Uh, but I think the main the main goal we want to achieve is actually to sell this nonlinear model uh, because we we have the information about carry trade. It's not a perfect information, uh, but uh, it as we have seen, uh, it, it really affects uh, exchange rate dynamics. Um, and it would be also nice not only to to look uh, against the U.S. dollar, but also consider different currency pairs. Uh, because carry trade is not only happening against US dollar, uh, but this is still on the list. And um, yeah, exactly. Let me stop here uh, in order to conserve time. And I'm very much looking forward to your uh, discussion. Yeah. All right. Cool. Thank you, Thomas, for inviting me to discuss this uh, paper. Pleasure to be here. Usual disclaimer applied. These are my own opinions and not those of the BIS. Okay, so let me try to reintroduce what the paper is trying to do in a very pedagogical way. Maybe it's too much for this audience, but I mean, it's too, it's too simple for this audience, but, but mm -hmm. I like simple stuff. Okay, so the main question is, is what is the impact of US monetary policy short on, on foreign currency vis-a-vis uh, -vis the dollar? Now, if we start from a very simple model in which there is no currency risk or investors are risk neutral, then the no arbitrary condition would imply the, uh, the conventional and covered interest rate parity, right? This just says that, uh, that the expected um, depreciation of the foreign currency is proportional to the interest rate differential, which in turn implies that a US tightening should appreciate uh, the dollar vis-a-vis -vis the foreign currency in order to generate an expected depreciation. Now, does this relationship hold in, in the data? Well, the empirical evidence seems to suggest that once you properly identify the, 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 the US monetary policy shock, it kind of holds on average, right? The dollar tends to appreciate after a tightening, uh, after a Fed's tightening. However, there are, as uh, Engel and Frankel uh, noticed already uh, oh, 40 years ago. Um, there are many days in which Fed tightening is associated with a depreciation of the dollar rather than an appreciation of the dollar. So how can we explain this, this, this seemingly, uh, this, this puzzling behavior of, of the dollar? Well, if we were to look at a more general model of the exchange rate that takes into consideration risk, premium, and convenience yield, then we would see that the expected depreciation of the foreign currency vis-a-vis -vis the dollar, it's not only proportional to the interest rate differential, but it's also affected by the currency risk premium and by the convenience yield of the, of the dollar relative to the convenience yield of the currency that we are uh, comparing it to. And now here is the key idea. Well, now a US monetary policy shock does not affect the exchange rate only by altering the interest rate differential, but it might have, but it also affected through these additional two channels. That is once the Fed tightening, something happens to the risk premium required by the investor or to the dollar convenience yield. And this changes this through this channel, the relationship between the US um, policy rate and the exchange rate and um, can actually change sign. And that's indeed what the literature has gone in this in the, in, 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 in these recent, recent years. Uh, most of the literature has, and it seems to uh, a robust result of the literature is that, well, different type of monetary policy shock 
have different effect on the on the risk premium. Pure monetary policy shock tend to uh, not change the risk premium, I would say, and therefore leads to an appreciation of the currency. While information shock that is tightening that are associated with uh, with an increase in the stock price, what uh, yeah, information uh, info what are typically called information uh, shock tend to have the opposite effect uh, because they tend to be associated with positive news about the US economy, so therefore they reduce the risk premium and therefore they tend to depreciate the dollar rather than appreciate. Okay, and then comes Thomas' paper. And the idea in Thomas' paper is, well, you know, the risk premium can behave differently, um, not only uh, due to the difference in the type of shock, the type of Fed tightening, but also uh, the response of this risk premium can be heterogeneous across currencies, depending on where how these currencies are used. Right? In particular, depending on which side of the carry trades these currencies are. Okay. So, investment currencies uh, for investment currencies, the risk premium might re react differently to a U.S. tightening shock compared to a funding currencies. And therefore, the behavior of these currencies in response to a US tightening might be different. And this is the hypothesis that this paper uh, is, is trying to test in, in, in a very, you know, in a nutshell. Okay, so let's see how they do it. So they start with the linear model that Thomas explained, so I will not go through it again. And I really like this step because it's very simple. Oh, it's, 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 uh, it's 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 um it's an unconventional exercise, I think, and I like simple exercise. Oops, uh, but I think that math, math, you can you can extract much more information from here. For example, here we are plotting the the the, the response uh, of the various currency to a monetary policy shock and to an information shock. But what I would really like to see is, is the plot of the difference between the response for each currencies. Right? I would like to see this shock in which it is chart in which you plot the difference between these two points and i would like to know whether this difference is statistical significance and for how many currencies right because plotting it like this when you change the order gives the impression that you know there is there is there is basically a shift of the response and it seems that these the the differential impact of the shock applies to every currency but i'm not sure whether that is true after that, I would I would try to uh, to try to clusterize the different currencies depending on their response and depending on whether the differential response to the two shocks is significant or not, right? And see whether this this clusterization aligns with uh, with 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 how we uh, would label these currencies according to investment funding currency or safe haven currency, or you can do the opposite exercise and you can. Start with uh, with uh, with uh, with uh, putting these currencies into buckets: investment, funding, safe haven currency, and then simply run uh, a panel regression for, with dummies and see whether you find uh, significantly different uh, coefficients. This is you know plain vanilla. I I, I could run that stuff without not being in the in the empirical finance literature. And and the reason why I like this exercise is because. I don't really like the second exercise. <laughs> uh, and the reason is, uh, I, I'm not a fan of Markov switching models. I, I, I've used them and I've learned that they are extremely delicate. You change one assumption, the results change dramatically. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, yeah, they are, they are super delicate. So I would really see, uh, I would really need to see much more to be convinced that this is actually a good model, it fits the data well, and I can really trust the results of this model. For example, which parameters are significantly different across these three regimes that they are that, that you are estimating? And are these parameters associated uh, related to the story that we are trying to test here? One thing, one, one thing that you can um, uh, think of doing immediately, you have a model, right? Rather than plotting the empirical, uh, empirical moments like you show in your slides, why, why don't you compute the theoretical moment? Why don't you compute expected excess returns of each currency in the various regimes and you tell me whether they align with, 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 with the intuition, right? Intuitively, 
So this is the third regime, where in um, it's a regime in which the currency is used mostly as an investment currency, right? So in this regime, I would expect that the expected excess return of this currency is higher than in this regime, okay? And higher than in this regime, correct? So does this hold in, in your estimated model or not? This sort of like robustness test uh, to convince me that, that, you know, we are really capturing what we are meant to capture with this. Um, the other thing, uh, and I mean, I checked in the appendix, but it was really hard to, uh, to see just by looking at the graphs. Can you tell me more about the probabilities that you estimate of being in one regime compared to the other? Are they, are they positively correlated across currencies? Because if they are, then it seems to me that you are capturing time fixed effect. Or are they negatively correlated across groups of currencies, right? In that case, you would, you would be capturing um, uh, carry trade time fixed effect. There are periods in which funding currencies are used for funding and investment currencies are used for investment reasons. And these are periods in which there is a lot of carry trade activity and periods in which the relationship switches. But that doesn't mean that investment currencies now are used for funding and vice versa. It simply means that these are periods in which there is a not a lot of carry trade activity. Okay. Um, and I'm saying this because by looking at these thresholds that you estimate, it doesn't look like the sign changes for many currencies. So for, for, for an investment currencies, um, if I'm not mistaken, the net open interest has to be positive, right? So for the Australian dollar uh, in the third regime, you know, gamma two is positive, it's higher than gamma one, but still gamma one is positive as well. So it seems to me that this index that you're using, you call this regime investment and funding, but to me, this seems to capture more like an intensity of carry trade rather than rather than that the currency is switching its role in the carry trade, uh, in the carry trade strategy, right? But if it's an intense, if, it, if it, that variable is like a, a, um, a, a carry trade intensity variable, why don't you just simply modeling with an interaction term, right? You just try to estimate the response of the exchange rate and you add this interaction term with the net open interest. And, and, the, and, and again, um, the question is, is, is it appropriate to model the, 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 the hypothesis that you have in mind as a Markov switching uh, process or not? Or it's more like an intensity type of story? Because that, if that's the case, then I would say that an interaction by, uh, variable approach would be more appropriate. Um, OK, now let's look at the results. Okay, and these are the main results. Uh, let me summarize it uh, in this way. It seems that there is some evidence that carry trade intensity amplifies the behavior of investment currencies, right? After a monetary policy shock, it seems that the Australian dollars and New Zealand dollars tend to uh, depreciate more when they are when carry trade um, intensity, carry trade activity is high for, you know, when carry trade intensity is high, blue versus uh, black, and they appreciate more after an information shock. For funding currency, uh, the same things apply. The carry trade intensity seems to amplify the response, their response, but only in response to a monetary policy shock. Again, here it seems that they uh, they tend to uh, they tend to um, depreciate less when they are uh, sorry they tend to since these are funding currencies it's the other way around they tend to depreciate more when they are in their funding uh, position rather than in the investment position. But I can't help uh, but wonder how much of this difference is statistically significant. If I look at these. Uh, I can just guess that maybe for the Australian dollar and for the Mexican pesos after an information shock, but what about everything else? So, uh, so that's that's really like a, a concern that I I, uh, I would have in my in my mind. Uh, it seems like it's going in that direction, but again, doesn't seem that there is a lot of significance here. And then you didn't present these 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 results, so I'm gonna I'm gonna. Uh, discuss it quickly. Um, 
So now with this regime identified, uh, in fact, to test whether the four uh, premium puzzle is, is worse in one regime or the other. And the result seems to suggest that actually the four premium puzzle is worse when, um, when, the, when the currencies are in that first regime, that is they are in their funding regime, okay? But this doesn't really square with my intuition, right? If the carry trade activity is the main driver of the forward premium puzzle, then we should expect that the, the, the coefficient is lower, is negative and lower in regime three for investment currencies, right? Because this is the regime in which investment currencies are, are used the most in carry trades. Uh, activity, right? And only for funding currency, I should expect to, to, to have a lower coefficient in regime one. But this doesn't seem to be the case. If you look at the Australian dollar, it seems that the forward guidance puzzle is worse in regime one, meaning that when it's not used as an investment currency, uh, same thing for the New Zealand dollars and, and same thing for the Mexican pesos. So it really doesn't square with this with this explanation that it's it's the carry trade activity that is that is that is driving um, the the forward premium pass. Um, so I would like to understand more what what could be the cause of this. Um, okay, that's it. I think I'm perfectly on time. Let me summarize. I really like the the, the, the broad agenda, and I actually really like the specific idea of this paper, trying to understand whether the the response of the currency of 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 um, of foreign currency vis-a-vis -vis the dollar depends not only on the type of uh, U.S. monetary policy shock, but also on the on on whether these uh, these currency are used uh, in the carry trade or not, and whether they are investment or funding currency or even say payment currency. Uh, but this is a very ambitious idea. Uh, there are some initial results, I would say, uh, but finding something significant is 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 really hard. Uh, however, when you do it, then it's it's going to be a home run. So, so my, my main comments, I would say it's, it's, it's keep swinging. Uh, and, uh, yeah, and that's uh, okay. Thanks. Unfortunately, I have too much time, so I will skip the Q&A of my paper, maybe to the break, uh, and uh, give the, the remaining uh, 30 minutes to Daniel. Um, yeah. I think it's in fact because we are having a lot of interest. When it shifts to the index or when it shifts from property to money, then if you have the next many shifts, then it's So if for the Japanese demand, you always have a sign of it, it's an interest to the sign of it. Yeah, I mean, it's a good point. We should discuss because there's a technical issue. Feel yeah, okay. so free to talk about the data some more. So I just had a question. I'm just trying to get my probably for 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 that because they have two different stories out of the same paper. Are you talking about intensity of funding or using funding or like investing in the same, same currency? And instead, your story is a switching between one and the other regime. And I wonder whether starting from this natural interest, you can already distinguish between these two advertisements. Yeah, actually, that was what I was thinking uh, when reading about the state of interest, but actually, it's, it's a fair point. It's the sign doesn't change a lot. Like, yeah, and then it's more it's uniform. But it's okay. but okay, it's just changed the narrative, so you know, like no, the words that you will yeah, be yeah, right, but, but uh, it doesn't change how you that you yeah. the message, right? Okay. okay, so okay, very sorry about that, guys. Uh, thanks for your patience. Um, and thank you, Thomas, for, for putting the paper uh, in the program. Uh, so the paper is called U.S. Risk and Treasury Convenience. It's co-authored with Giancarlo Corsetti, Simon Lloyd, and Emil Maha. Uh, and the usual disclaimer applies, uh, these are just uh, our views, and they're definitely not those uh, of the Bank of England. Maybe I can move this cursor a little bit. Okay. 
So in this paper, we look to sort of reassess the extent to which the US and the dollar are special and safe in the global financial system. And in particular, we're going to focus on sort of the US's unique position in three key markets, FX, equities, and bonds. So in terms of equities, you know, by virtue of you know, the US's uh, external assets being tilted towards traditionally high yielding foreign equities, the US is able to earn considerable wealth from the rest of the world during normal times. This is the so-called exorbitant privilege. And one way of measuring the extent of this exorbitant privilege is the differential between the return on foreign equities and the return on US equities. That has traditionally been positive uh, over time. In terms of FX, uh, you know, the specialness of the dollar is exemplified by the fact that the dollar experiences large appreciations during periods of global stress as foreign investors sort of fly to safety. And you can measure the extent of this specialness through the exchange rate risk premium, which was discussed uh, a fair bit in the last slide, uh, in the last presentation. Uh, and in particular, that can be measured as the deviation from uncovered interest rate parity. And finally, in bond markets, U.S. Treasuries command a convenience yield due to their safety, liquidity, or, or value as collateral uh, as compared to other foreign countries' uh, government bonds. And this is especially true at short maturities. And it implies that you can, uh, the, the U.S. government can issue debt at a relative discount compared to other countries' government bonds. Government. And you can measure these convenience yields uh, as in the uh, John Christian Murthy and Lucy paper, using these deviations from covered interest parity. So specifically in this paper, we're going to ask how are these different dimensions of U.S. specialness interlinked? Further, in what dimensions exactly? So in asset classes, horizons, maturities, is the U.S. truly safe? And is U.S. specialness sort of eroding over time? Okay, so one motivation for this paper comes from bond markets. In particular, the striking difference in the relative convenience of short maturity treasuries as compared to long maturity treasuries. So these, uh, these charts are calculated using deviations from covered interest parity in the method of John Krishnamurthy and Lustig, and positive values imply that U.S. treasuries offer greater convenience than foreign government bonds. So we see it at short horizons, these convenience yields are positive over the past 20 years. They spike during periods of stress, but overall there's been relatively little trend over time. However, at long maturities, whereas convenience yields used to be very large and positive for treasuries, they experienced a secular decline over the past 20 years, such that they recently have been actually turned negative relative to an average of, of G7, uh, other G7 currencies. So this implies that before investors were willing to forego return to hold US treasuries, but now they actually require return to hold the world reserve asset. Now, a second motivation for this paper comes from FX and, uh, and equity markets. So specifically the fact that the standard two country no arbitrage model predicts that relative long run risk between countries, which you can think of as relative long run consumption growth risk, should be equal to the long run exchange rate risk premium. So I plot this long run exchange rate risk premium here, which is just the carry trade return fashion using long maturity bonds. And we see that it's about zero on average uh, and has very no clear trend. So this would imply by virtue of this model that long run, uh, long run relative risk across countries should be equal. In this left chart here though, I plot the uh, measure of, uh, of US long run risk from short by this song in your row, uh, which is basically the volatility of the permanent component of US consumption growth. And we see that that has been trending up over the past from 2015, which is the last date uh, that this uh, variable is available. Can I ask you, Please. if the stand up was really a shift in really down and down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, 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 it's not really it's right there. It's just kind of a crisis in 2008. No, what is there any dependent? So this is not the measure that we're going to use, and you're going to see that uh, our measure of long run risk it also is trending upwards over time, but it's going to be coming. It's going to be coming from equities, uh, uh, largely. Um, but I, I agree, this is not necessarily completely smooth. Um, but you see, you know, there's a large fall in the convenience yield at the start of the sample which also was rising there as well, slows down and so forth. But anyway, our measure of US long-run risk, we're gonna show an even stronger result, which is that US long-run risk seems to be growing relative to other G7 currencies. Yes. You would just answer. Yes. So this, this is just the measure of US long-run risk. Our measure is going to be, we're gonna even show something stronger, which is it's relative. Exactly. So, not, it's just one, because the first thing to think is, uh, well, there is someone that was buying and is not buying anymore. And there is a big player in the in the world of that, and we call it China. So mm. you told that the fact that this can reflect the fact that China has changed dramatically. Interesting. 
So uh, that's not our story. Uh, our, our model is going to be agnostic as to the underlying driver of this. Uh, but our story actually relates more to the fact uh, that investor, investors might have less confidence in the long run stability of the US, not necessarily because of another player, mm -hmm. but in general, after two sort of you know, large crises that took place in the uh, uh, during the 2000s that had their origins uh, in the US, like the dot-com bubble and, uh, and uh, the GFC. So this suggests that potentially this model is incomplete. So in this paper, we're going to start by developing a two-country no arbitrage setup to interlink these measures of U.S. safety in three in our three key markets: FX, bonds, and equities. And equilibrium in our model is going to be characterized by an equation that says that an increase in U.S. relative risk can elicit adjustments through two channels: either through the pecuniary returns, the traditional channel, exchange rate risk premium, or a second channel, which is going to prove crucial to us, which is the long run, uh, or which is the convenience yields on U.S. Treasuries relative to other countries' government bonds. And in particular, in the long run, which is what we're going to be particularly is interested in in this paper, countries are going to be able to have different levels of permanent risk, even though long-run carry trade returns are near zero, because these risk differentials are going to materialize in convenience. In the empirical part, uh, we're going to do two things. First, we're going to construct measures of U.S. relative risk in uh, each of our three markets and at different horizons. And then we're going to use these uh, to test our model implied relationships. Um, okay, so our main contribution in the measurements category is that uh, we're going to construct these measures of SDF risk, consumption, growth risk using data on equity risk premia, bond term premia, and convenience. And this is inspired by the Alvarez and Nierman bounds which we're going to generalize to uh, account for convenience yields on domestic assets. And when we take these, uh, when we basically apply these, these measures uh, to our uh, equilibrium relationships, we're going to show that the rise in U.S. long-run risk and the fall in long-run trading treasury convenience seem to be two sides of the same coin, helping rationalize a, a, a pretty uh, a puzzle in the version. Yes. So the risk here really mean an increase in like, volatility of like, some underlying shocks, right? Oh, an increase in volatility of essentially uh, permanent shocks, long run, long run consumption. Yeah, shocks. because I'm still struggling to understand. So like if I showed like the volatility of the long run component of consumption, growth, like yeah. what does it mean? Does it mean like we are more uncertain about long run? Exactly, or... exactly. That's so actually the story. It's getting lower or higher, right? You could even say the mean stays the same, but it's just. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. You're going to need compensation for bearing the risk of having long run uncertainty for some kind of growth. Okay. And this, you argue this is only present in the US. Uh, this is more present in the US than in other countries. Exactly. That's what, that's what, that's what um, our, our, our measure is. Okay. So let's jump into the model. It's going to be an asset pricing model. There's going to be two countries. Uh, the home is the US and the foreign, uh, which you know with an asterisk. Representative investors in each country are going to in each country are going to have pricing kernels lambda and lambda star, and the SDF is just going to be uh, the ratio of those across time. Following Alvarez and German, we're going to decompose these pricing kernels into a permanent component, which is a martingale, and a residual transitory component. So this goes to your question: the ensuing permanent component of the SDF is going to reflect the long run level of consumption growth, essentially, and things that can affect this long run level. Are, for example, changes in the steady state and probability of financial crisis or disaster, or the long run level of growth. Okay, the transitory component, on the other hand, is going to reflect the intertemporally smoothable component of consumption growth. So, the classic example here is business cycle risk. And in terms of actual risk here, how are we going to measure risk? We're going to measure risk as the conditional entropy or volatility of these stochastic discount factors. So, this is going to B equal to the expectation of the log of the SDF minus the log of the expectation. So it's a measure of curvature. Um, and if the SDF is log normally distributed, this is just going to be equal to one half of the variance. Otherwise, it's going to include uh, all higher order cumulants. And we're not going to make the assumption of log normality. You can also define the volatility of the permanent component of the SDF, uh, which is what we're really going to be interested in here. Uh, and the idea basically is, um, you know, that if that volatility is larger, you're more uncertain about long-run growth prospects, so you're riskier in the long run. And we're going to use these SDFs to price these assets, bonds, equities, uh, and foreign. Okay, so bond markets. So we're going to allow agents to invest in a full-term structure of bonds, home and foreign bonds, 
whose maturities are going to be indexed by K. Um, importantly, we're going to allow these bonds to offer both a pecuniary return, R, and a non-pecuniary convenience yield, which we denote by theta. And importantly, these convenience yields are going to be both investor and asset specific. So for example, the home investor in pricing the home bond is going to take into account the pecuniary return R on that bond, but also the home investor specific convenience yield on that home bond, theta HH. On the other hand, for the foreign bond, they're going to take into account the local currency return of that foreign bond, accounting for the expected appreciation of the foreign currency, and the home investor specific convenience yields on the foreign bond, so theta HF. And you can have analogous expressions uh, for the foreign investor as well. And just like the literature, we're going to assume that these convenience yields are observable ex ante at time t. That's why we're able to pull them out of the expectation. Uh, that's pretty innocuous considering we're going to measure these convenience yields essentially using deviations from covered interest parity, which are known at, at time t. Okay. We're also going to allow these investors to invest in, in local uh, equities. Uh, whose norm, whose convenience yield we're going to normalize to zero. So you can think of those convenience yields in the previous slide as the relative convenience of bonds as compared to equities. So these are those Euler equations. And finally, these Euler equations are going to be satisfied uh, if exchange rates evolve as the ratio of investors to uh, stochastic discount factors multiplied by uh, a convenience yield wedge. Uh, now, importantly, because investors are going to face the same exchange rate process, no arbitrage implies that they also agree on the relative convenience of foreign compared to home uh, uh, government bonds. So in particular, the, convenience, the relative convenience the foreign investor earns on the treasury relative to their own foreign bond must be the same as what the home investor earns on the treasury relative to the foreign bond. And this quantity here is how we're going to think about, uh, you know, this is, how, this is the quantity that's going to map directly to CIP deviations in the model, right? How much you value the treasury compared to the foreign bond in terms of payments. Okay, so let's start to some results. Um, our first set of results are going to be about how we can think about risk in this model. Specifically, we're going to generalize the Alvarez and German bounds for SDF volatilities to account for the fact that in our model, safe bonds both offer a pecuniary return, but also a convenience. So clearly we can derive a lower bound for the total volatility of the SDF as being related to the equity risk premium minus the convenience yield on the short bond. So this is actually somewhat intuitive. Uh, the equity return, which is the return on the riskiest asset in the economy, can be expected to price all the risk in the economy, both permanent and transitory risk. Um, so it should be related to the volatility of the permanent component uh, of the total, total risk, sorry. And then when you go long in equity and forego going long uh, 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 a short bond, you also you not only lose the pecuniary return on that bond, but you also lose the convenience yield on that bond. Similarly, we can derive a lower bound for the permanent SDF risk, uh, which is going to have a similar intuition uh, uh, to the overall risk. It's going to be equal to the equity risk premium minus the term premium on an infinite maturity bond. So that captures sort of the totality of sort of transitory risk in the economy. And again, we're going to, when you go when you forego holding that long maturity bond, you also forego hold, getting that convenience yield between T and T plus one. So that's going to be our measure of permanent SDF risk uh, in, the, in our model. So before we, uh, I turn to some more results, uh, let me just discuss, because uh, I think it's important, how we're going to measure these, these quantities in the data. So the key thing we're going to need to estimate is uh, the equity risk premium, which is an notoriously challenging thing to estimate. Uh, for now, we're going to follow Fari and Gurio and calculate the equity risk premium using a Gordon growth model. So the equity risk premium in a given country is going to be equal to the dividend price, price ratio plus the expected growth rate of dividends minus sort of uh, the real risk free rate. And in our baseline, we proxy for this expected future dividend growth using lag dividend growth, uh, presumably because investors uh, 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 are, you know, they're, 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 they're making they observe the same data as we do. And we don't, in ideal world, we don't want to use future values to proxy for uh, for risk. Can I ask yes. Something that you, you can tell me. Oh, yeah, please. Thank you. Um, <laughs> your, your model is also accommodating some of the environment. So it's convenient yes. to uh, replicate some part of the home values in that direction. What extent do you mean? 
Oh, that's interesting. Um, so I, I was thinking that you meant more home bias in terms of uh, equities. But what exactly do you mean by uh, home bias? Okay, yeah, that, uh, because you have home and foreign, yeah. and that they, they have to invest on the foreign bonds and foreign land. It's the same as actual. Mm -hmm. We know that when you look at portfolio, the position of portfolio is usually mm -hmm. highly, you know, uh, concentrating more on domestic than on the sure. foreign that You introduce this term, you're foreign. Now you have four communities that they can take, and they want whether for the home person investing in a home house that it is convenient. So so at the end of the day, yeah, these convenience yields are just a wedge. I, I exactly. It, 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 it's a wedge. And, and, um, and, you know, when we take this model to the data, uh -huh. we're going to map these convenience yields to CIP deviations. So to the extent that CIP deviations reflect some fact that home investors want to hold the home bond for some non-pecuniary reason, I think the answer is yes. So once have had is to what extent mm -hmm. they can accommodate and then if your story really can capture also that part of it or just a like more part of yeah. it. Yeah, interesting part. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um so anyway, uh these are going to be our measures uh of relative uh, of a country's risks. We're going to construct these measures for both home and uh let's see all G7 uh economies. Uh, we're going to measure these within country convenience yields using swap treasury spreads, as in do Evan and Lee. Uh, and we're going to proxy for uh, expected term premium using uh, realized returns. So here are our measures uh, of relative risk. Uh, in particular, on the left, we've got the U.S. equity risk premium that we estimate net of the average G7 risk premium. And on the right, we have uh, our measure uh, of U.S. relative permanent risk. So we see that U.S. relative permanent risk is rising over time, uh, and in fact, uh, it's rising faster than the equity risk premium because um, because term premium in the U.S. have fallen relative to G7 on average. That's the that, that, that's the other uh, part of the story here. Yes. And can you say because this is relative risk? Yeah. Can you say is it like yeah, maybe you just said risk? Is it the U.S. like staying constant and the others getting safer, or is it the U.S. getting riskier by the others? They're both rising. This coefficient for the U.S. is about 0 0.56. So just U.S. equity risk premium, the, the, the slope of the line is about 0 0.056. So it's rising faster. The rest of the world is also rising. Equity risk premium and the rest of the world are also rising. It's getting more risky. Yeah, but U.S. is rising significantly faster. Okay, so given this, um, we can derive that equity relationship that I showed you in the first slide. Uh, so basically, we can rate U.S. relative permanent risk to the long-run UIP deviation and the long-run relative convenience of U.S. treasuries. Okay, the intuition for this expression is that if U.S. long-run risk rises, um, as compensation for bearing this greater long-run risk, you have to, U.S. investors are going to require either greater pecuniary returns or non-pecuniary returns to their cross-border holdings. So either you're going to have to give them a greater exchange rate risk premium. Or the convenience yield on, of U.S. treasuries must fall relative to the foreign bond so that the U.S. investor gets a greater non-pecuniary return on the foreign bond. So that's the intuition of this expression, okay? Now, absent convenience, sorry, absent convenience yields, long-run UIP holds, this is the loose of spotless and the bond results, it implies that relative long-run risk across countries should be equal. But in our setting, when you have convenience yields, instead it implies a very tight relationship between U.S. relative long-run risk and these convenience yields. So we want to test this in the data. Um, the first thing we do is uh, these, these, these quantities that we're interested in are, are non-stationary. So we first test if there's a co-integrating relationship, which there very clearly is, between our measure uh, of treasury convenience yields uh, and the various measures of uh, relative risk. And that implies that we can run regressions uh, to estimate the long run uh, relationship and arrive at sort of super consistent estimators for their long run uh, effects. And we see with these regressions on the right hand side that an increase in US relative risk leads to a fall in long maturity treasury convenience. Uh, this right chart here, this uh, sorry, this lowest um, uh, row is our measure, our ideal measure of US relative risk. Uh, the magnitudes imply that a one percentage point higher uh, US long run risk uh, predicts about a six basis point fall in long maturity treasury convenience. That can rationalize about one third of the observed fall in long maturity treasury convenience yields over the past 20 years. Um, 
Finally, we could drive actually a, a stronger relationship, which should hold period by period rather than just an unconditional average uh, if we move into sort of holding period space. So now the pecuniary returns we're talking about are the returns from taking a long position in a long maturity bond, financed by shorting a U.S. Treasury for one period, earning that exchange rate risk, risk premium, and then unwinding the position one period later. So we call this the uh, carry trade return on an infinite maturity bond. And you earn, as I said, the exchange rate risk premium plus the relative differential in sort of term premium across countries. And similarly, the convenience yield in this position, you earn the convenience yield, the relative convenience of the foreign bond at time t, but you sell the expected convenience yield on that bond x plus one when you unwind the position. Now, the intuition for this uh, expression is very similar to before. We're just in holding period space. Again, though, Lucy Savaltis and Vertolin show. Uh, that this quantity here is about zero. So it again should imply a tight relationship uh, uh, between uh, our two quantities of interest. In particular, if US long run risk rises, the long run treasury convenience yields must fall on impact so that in expectation, investors can get greater non pecuniary returns as compensation for risk. Uh, so, yeah, this is the last slide basically. So we can test this relationship again. Um, we have as our left-hand side variable, again, the long-run treasury convenience yields. This is how we control for the long-run carry trade return. And as a proxy for the expectation of convenience yields in the future, we use the future value of these convenience yields. We see, again, the negative relationship from before. In this case, we also decompose it into US risk uh, and foreign risk. And we see this result is driven entirely, the relationship between risk and convenience is driven entirely by the US term. So greater US risk in absolute terms is what seems to be driving this long-run convenience to fall. And we get similar results if we don't make this assumption with the Gordon growth formula, and we just use X post returns to proxy for risk. Okay, uh, so thanks very much, guys. Uh, basically, yeah, uh, overall in this paper, we develop a framework to assess different dimensions of US specialness in FX, bond, and equity markets. Uh, our main conclusion is that the rise in US long-run risk and decline in uh, treasury convenience seem to be two sides of the same coin. As I mentioned, our preferred interpretation is uh, relates to sort of scarring effects uh, of crises that originated uh, in the US. Thanks very much. There you go. So, I'll try my best not to keep people too long. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me to discuss this very interesting paper. Uh, I learned a lot reading it, and it connects some topics I've been very interested in, sort of narrowly to much broader questions in exchange rate risk premia and equity premia. So, for me, it was a great paper to learn a lot from. So this is theory and empirics that's trying to understand how convenience yields, exchange rates, and equity risk premia are related. And there are some papers without convenience yields that have looked at relationships between equity and FX risk premia, argue that there's some relatively strong relationships that must hold between them, which maybe don't seem to be true in the data necessarily. And this paper, by including convenience yields, has a pretty nice unified story uh, that gets to everything here for how the US versus the rest of the world relates. So the big facts, which are super awkward to explain without convenience yields, is we have uncovered interest rate parity holding at long horizons. So the carry trade exists, UIP short term, not so much. At long horizon, we think it does hold. Fact number two is the US CIP basis measured with treasuries, at least. I think it's true with other assets as well. But if we look at long dated treasuries, let's say in the 10 year range versus 10 year foreign government bonds, the CIP basis there has gone to zero or even negative. And it seems that during that time period, US equities have outperformed foreign equities. And the argument is number two and number three are effectively two sides of the same coin. So without convenience yields, UIP holding means that effectively risk premia in different countries have to be very related to each other because the entropy or volatility, depending how you want to think about it, of their stochastic discount factors can't be too different. So here's fact number one from a previous paper. You make money doing the carry trade. That's the red line here. 
But if you look at those carry trade countries and buy their long-term bonds, finance with short-term bonds, or swap it from long short-term to long-term exposure, that cancels each other out. The sum of the red and blue lines are a ballpark of zero here, suggesting that for long maturities, the carry trade basically doesn't exist. UIP is approximately true. Here's fact number two. The U.S. in recent years has been outperforming foreign equity markets. We've got realized returns on one side and their sort of Gordon growth dividend discount ex-ante expectation on the other side. And on both of them, it looks like having a U.S. bias is good. Um, my Vanguard account's very happy about this. I'm too lazy to diversify very well, so I got lucky. All right, <laughs> fact number three. Uh, the U.S. Treasury basis used to be positive at long maturity. It's become a little bit negative, and this is sort of in the ballpark 30-ish basis points down to minus 10, almost 20-ish basis points. At short horizon, we don't seem to find that, but we're interested in long horizon relationships here. That's where the awkwardness seems to arise, so this is an interesting fact. All right, so the theoretical setting we're trying to use to integrate this is first we want to relate risk premia in the equity market to the behavior of stochastic discount factors. And they relate to this argument from Alvarez and Yerman that for any risky asset, we have a lower bound either on entropy or if you want to think of log normal terms, uh, volatility of the stochastic discount factor based on the expected log excess return of that risky asset. If you include convenience yield, as they do, you get a little bit of a wedge there. And they have both a short horizon version of this and then a long horizon as well, based on this decomposition of SDFs into a long dated martingale term and then sort of transitory fluctuations around it. Don't have time for the math, but they talked about that in the previous. Okay, and then if you have that decomposition, you have this relationship it has to hold, but the differences in these entropies or volatilities of SDFs and then differences coming into risk premia and foreign exchange between the countries and then this sort of long horizon notion of convenience yield differences, that has to add up to zero. The data is suggesting there are no long horizon FX risk premia. So in previous papers, that would say, well, we have to have the same entropy or volatility of the SDFs. How can we have different equity premia? But if we have convenience yields as our sort of residual to make the equation hold, then we have an empirical relationship we can think about. Do differences in SDF volatility, which we're going to proxy with equity risk premia, seem to be related to how convenience yields move over time. All right, and they bring the theory to data with some regressions. And the main thing they do is they want to predict changes in convenience yields. Well, I guess predict is really the wrong term, cross-sectionally. I don't think it's a long forecasting exercise, but do they sort of move together? This relative risk measure versus this convenience yield measure. There's various controls in the paper, fixed effects, no fixed effects. I don't want to get too into the details of it, but broadly what they show is when it looks like the equity premium is increasing in a country, that has something to do with their convenience yield falling. That explains, one, that U.S. graph, but this is from a panel data regression. So qualitatively, that relationship seems to be there. My first comment is uh, the expected returns of stocks. I think maybe there's a slightly better measure. There's this SVIX measure that Ian Martin likes to use. Um, we're under some assumptions. You get a lower bound on expected returns by looking at stuff in options markets. Um, I think that data is not super hard to have. I found my way to getting it for other reasons. Uh, and because that serves something with no moving parts in it, I think some just like relatively raw reduced form evidence that here's CIP deviations moving, here's these SVIX things moving. Uh, it should sort of hit you in the, if the story is super strong, it'll be kind of direct if you play with this kind of measure. I guess another question would be, why do we have or not have fixed effects for countries in these regressions? That arbitrage relationship should just literally be true. Um, why, I mean, in the empirical work, of course, there's judgments, but if I take the model 100% literally, it should be robust to literally anything you throw at it. So I'm curious your thoughts on the, prop, the, the, the specification. Comment number two is maybe we want to think about the cross-section of countries more. We're framing this about sort of the U.S. versus everybody else. But if we think about CIP deviations, there's this strong pattern of Treasury CIP deviations and the level of nominal interest rates. Does that line up with the cross-section of expected equity returns? That would be super cool if it's true. Um, I might be sort of asking for more than the, the data cooperates with us. And a related thing I want to say here is if we think about magnitudes, CIP bases are like 20, 30-ish basis points. Differences in expected returns and equities are measured in percents. 
There's this trick that they follow from Jen Krishnamurthy and Lustig, which allows you to multiply your CIP basis by 10 roughly. So what you do is you look at how exchange rates move. You look at how convenience yields move. You say, well, just the convenience yield is moving here that call it the exchange rate movement. Therefore, it needs to be 10 times bigger. So the residual, which could be a correlated risk premium, is named a magnification of the convenience yield. It feels a little bit like, you know, rare disasters have, you know, hard to observe measures of the SDF are now becoming hard to observe measures of a larger arbitrage spread. So we're naming the residual two different ways is kind of my take on how this literature has evolved. I'm a little bit skeptical of both approaches and just think the world is kind of complicated, but I think that's really crucial for lining up the magnitudes here. Can we say that the movements in the CIP basis and the movements in the difference in the equity premium conceptually are the right size relative to each other? I think here and in many papers is a, a big question. Another thing is within country convenience yields. Um, so this is where they mentioned my work a little bit. We have a measure where we compare an option implied risk-free rate to treasury yields. When you strip that out and you look at CIP bases on our option implied rates, there is no cross-section across countries. Um, so we think there's maybe sort of two separate things here, like a constant notion of an international arbitrage spread and then a domestic thing, which varies with the level of nominal interest rates. Depending how you think about that, you might or might not want to scale up or scale down your treasury risk premium. There might be... The treasury CIP deviation might measure something which is partially something you want to scale, which doesn't vary with interest rates and something which does vary with interest rates you don't want to scale. I'm not sure the exact answer, but the data here, I think, sort of raises some kind of tricky, complicated questions. Another thing is, so you can't really use my measure because it's too short maturity. Um, the corporate CIP basis from Gordon Liao, we thought looked sort of less convenient in terms of does that spread vary with nominal interest rates the way you would expect from, say, Stefan Nagel's work. Um, and the last thing I want to say, I guess I mentioned this quickly, is the relative magnitudes of uh, convenience yields versus risk premium is really important here. If long duration UIP really holds, there should be a one for one relationship with, with these. But really what we've just gotten from the empirical work is that the sort of the slope of the relationship is correct. Telling me how that regression coefficient maps into something conceptual there, I think that may be very difficult. But if you could nail that down, I think that's if you take the model literally what the implication should be. So to quickly conclude, we have a new joint understanding of convenience yields, risk premium, equity markets, and in currency markets. And the paper is really nice because it's sharply conceptual. Here, there's a strong relationship, which is surprising if you don't do some fancy math. But the fancy math pushes you to a very robust result at the end. And the empirical work, I think, is very suggestive of at least the mechanisms behind it making a lot of sense. And maybe the, the numbers do or don't line up precisely. Um, but broadly, this idea that the drop in the U.S. convenience deal and this rise in long run risk being related to each other, I never would have thought about without this sort of relatively technical machinery, but ex post seems plausible and quite intuitive. So I definitely learned a lot on the paper. Thanks so much.